On today's Star Wars Legends lore video, I explain planetary shielding. Hey guys, this is Zekrat Slaughter, hello and welcome to another Star Wars Legends lore video. Before I begin, I want to ask you guys for a favor. I recently did a super fun video with a new YouTube group known as The Family Bovine. I'm not officially part of this group or anything, but I really, really enjoy their videos, and it would mean a lot to me if you guys would check out the one I've put down in the description. Also, subscribe if you enjoy their content. I think it's really important to support new and up-and-coming YouTube channels, and I really enjoy their content, which is why I reached out and asked if I could be in a video. With that out of the way, let's get into our discussion on planetary shielding. I think it's important first that we understand the basic basics of shielding within the Star Wars universe generally. One giant misconception that people have is that Star Wars shields work only against energy. That's not at all true. Deflector shielding, which is a catch-all term for the most popular type of shield within the Star Wars universe, can be composed of ray and particle shields. Particle shields obviously protect against physical matter, while energy or ray shielding protects against things like blasters or plasma. A planetary shield, which is essentially an upsized version of a shield you'd find on a starship can thus protect against energy attacks on a planet, for example orbital bombardments, while also stopping physical objects, and this could be everything from a rogue meteorite to a ship trying to land on the planet's surface. Shielding is a very expensive but also incredibly important part of a planet's defense. With your shield up, you can stop ships from leaving or entering the planet's atmosphere, you can try to wait out orbital bombardments, and just generally you can make it extremely difficult for an opponent to capture your planet with without a long drawn out conflict. However, there is a bit more nuance associated with planetary shielding. Sure, being able to deny enemies access to your planet is great, but it comes with several disadvantages. First of all, if the shield is covering the entire planet, that means that friendly ships or people like commercial traders also can't leave or enter. So for Coruscant or really any planet that sees a lot of visitors, it's not really practical to have the full shield up 24-7. The shields also take a tremendous amount of energy, and for that reason, Reason will often only be activated if there's any real harm. Worlds often make use of a few dozen or more shield generators. This allows the planetary shield to be manipulated on a fairly sophisticated level. I think this is best illustrated in the final book of the Thrawn trilogy, The Last Command. Other ships, mostly freighters and other commercial types, could be seen dropping through the brief gaps ground control was opening for them in Yukio's planetary shield, a hazy blue shell surrounding the planet about 50 kilometers above the surface. So here, here, small portions of Yukio's shield are being opened so ships can pass through to the planet's surface. The following is another quote. With planetary shields able to hold off all but the most massive turbolaser and proton torpedo bombardment, conventional wisdom held that the only way to subdue a modern world was to put a fast moving ground force down at the edges and send them overland to destroy the shield generators. Between the fire laid down by the ground force and the subsequent orbital assault, the target world was always badly damaged by the time it was finally taken. This leads to Thrawn's plan, and he wants to capture Yukio without destroying the shield generators. The way he does so is actually genius. Cloaking technology was fairly rare at the time in the Star Wars universe, so he sneaks cloak ships through the open planetary shield. He later appears with the fleet, at which point Yukio closes the shield. He tells them that he's developed new technology which can bypass planetary shields, a total lie, and fires on the planet. At the same time, he has the cloak ships underneath the shield fire at major targets on the ground. The Imperials know that the shield worked just fine, easily absorbing their turbolaser blasts, but to those on the ground, it appears like they shot through the energy shield completely. Planetary shielding actually plays a big role in other Star Wars Legends stories. We get the following quote from Wedge's Gamble, talking about the importance of energy shields and how to defeat them. Akbar clasped his hands behind his back. As formidable as all that is, the primary problem in taking Coruscant is the overlapping defense shield. He later goes on to explain that Coruscant's shielding is so formidable that a direct assault on the planet would cost more casualties than both Death Star attacks combined. Wedge then says that to take down an energy shield, the standard doctrine is to probe it for weaknesses including atmospheric anomalies, then targeting those weakened sectors and trying to punch through them. From there, you can either land 
troops or try to destroy the generator from orbit. In the end, the New Republic chooses instead to land troops and covertly take down the shield generators from the planet's surface. Let's look at how shielding has been portrayed in other media. In A New Hope, we see the Death Star overload the planetary shields of Alderaan, destroying the planet instantly. This reinforces the fact that defensive shields don't have an infinite capacity and can be destroyed or disabled through a large amount of power. The weak spot on the first Death Star was also ray shielded, which is why torpedoes had to be used. Ray shielding again stops energy, not physical objects. The Death Star itself also had an energy shield, but there were small enough gaps that the X-Wings could fit through. The second Death Star was fully shielded, which is why you see the Alliance fleet break formation when they discover that the shield is still up. Another major use of energy shielding comes in the Empire Strikes Back. There, an energy shield protects the Rebel base, which prevents orbital bombardment. The question then is, well, how did the Empire manage to land troops? Well, we actually hear an Imperial officer say that ComScan has detected an energy field protecting an area of the planet, rather than the whole planet itself. Presumably, they landed Blizzard Force outside of the shielded area, then walked in. The Alliance would have had to briefly lower the shield as the GR-75 transports left and as the Ion Cannon fired. In canon, we also have Scarif's planetary shield that has a sort of unique shield gate. There's an area where ships can fly through, but which can be fully closed. We clearly see in Rogue One that shielding not only stops energy, but also physical objects, like an X-Wing. Starkiller Base also has shielding, which is why the Millennium Falcon has to enter in hyperspace. There's some sort of refractory period or something. I don't really know. But that is my basic primer on shielding. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, and if you have any questions, post it down in the comments. Myself or someone else, I'm sure, will try to answer. Thanks again so much for watching, guys. As I said, please check out that video that I linked. It would mean a lot to me. Until next time, may the Force be with you.